So, having just done another video about cultural appropriation, <laughs> I wanted to discuss this issue of my relationship with the Hindu god Shiva, or perhaps I should pronounce it Siva, because I'm really not sure what to do about Shiva and my pagan altar. Whether to reinstate him, I did actually retire him, for reasons which I will come to in a minute. Um, but I'm wondering, now that I'm firmly of the opinion that this whole cultural appropriation argument is largely bullshit, um, I'm wondering whether to reinstate him. However, there are some, I think, valid reasons why I thought I should retire him from my altar. But it's complicated, so I want to go into it all now. My relationship with Eastern religions and with Shiva in particular, um, the concerns I had with regards to my paganism, uh, not quite chiming in with Hinduism. I don't know, just various thoughts I've got back and forth about this. Oh yeah, and I'm, I'm, and I'm really interested to see what any Hindus out there think about this, because that's really who I'm aiming this video for. I want guidance and advice on this matter from the people who would know best. <laughs> people of the Hindu faith. So any Hindus out there who are watching this, please tell me what you think. So, let's start with my history of infatuation or <laughs> fascination or admiration for Eastern spirituality, by which I mean primarily Buddhism and Hinduism. I was raised Christian. Um, but very early on I started drawing, I mean, during my teenage years really I think, started drawing inspiration from other areas of spirituality. Um, I was fascinated by the pagan myths I read about in a mythology book I had at home. Uh, the Greek and Egyptian myths in particular fascinated me. Um, but I also I learned in school a little bit about Hinduism. Uh, I'm not sure how good my uh, education was on that matter but uh, I, I heard enough about it that it, it, it did inspire me and interest me. Uh, because of all these other interests, I did start wondering about things like reincarnation and stuff during my teenage years. Um, later on, when I started moving on from Christianity and embracing things like paganism, I also started embracing some of these Eastern philosophies. I had a book called The Tao of Pooh, <laughs> comparing Winnie the Pooh to uh, Taoist philosophy, um, and this led me to buy the Tao Te Ching, which I do indeed still have. Um, and yes, I've read it. <laughs> and yes, it's uh, fascinating and wise in, in its own way. Um, and um, I started looking into Buddhism and Hinduism a little bit as well. Um, another thing I got back then was the Upanishads, which I blew my mind. I found so profound. Uh, beginning of my pantheism really, you know, there's an essence of God in everything really, in a way. Then, and Buddhism is something I've toyed with and been influenced with at various points in my life. Mostly that came later, uh, during my adult years, um, during my, you know, thirties and so on, that I became more and more interested in aspects of Buddhism. And Buddhism has hugely inspired my way of looking at life and the world, though I would not claim myself to be a Buddhist, though there have been times when I've been moving in that direction a lot more. In the end I figured I'm not really a Buddhist, but I have been inspired by aspects of Buddhism. And of course I've been inspired by aspects of Hinduism. So what drew me to Shiva in particular? Because I remember somewhere in my mid-twenties I bought uh, that Shiva figurine, which I still own, and which has been on my altar at times. Um, and I'm wondering whether to reinstate it. What is it about Shiva that interests me? Well, one of the main reasons has been, particularly in that form of Nataraja, where Shiva is dancing that dance of destruction, but as I understand it, it's also creation. Inside a circle, which I find very symbolic of that as well, that this is Shiva the destroyer dancing a dance of destruction but a dance which allows new creation to come because Hinduism is full of this six cyclical way of looking at the cosmos you know destruction leads to new creation and round and round it goes and Shiva at the apex of that process um, apex I don't know at, at the very center of that process uh, where, where 
ashes in destruction, but creation results from it. So she was this renewing kind of uh, thing. This has long since inspired me because being a pantheist, viewing all things as divine in a sense, it's very important for me to have a image of the divine that represents that, that represents that this is all things, the whole cosmic wheel of destruction and creation. Um, and she was that for me. Um, and as I've learned over the years of being fascinated with Hinduism and, and with Shiva in particular, uh, I've obviously done a lot of reading and studying about the religion, I have become more and more inspired by what Shiva represents. Shiva is erotic, I mean you've, you've got those phallus kind of those stones, um, the name of which escapes me at the moment, but um, lingam, something like that. Um, and you know, there's erotic qualities to Shiva, but also ascetic qualities of, of, of renoun renouncing the world um, to meditate and, <laughs> um, and of giving up things, of self-denial, um, the whole ascetic lifestyle, the monastic kind of lifestyle. Uh, Shiva represents both erotic and as ascetic. This is like a, a, a juxtaposition, a contradiction, yeah? But it's part of how Shiva is all things, you see. And then, more recently still I discovered, which because of my own non-binary, genderqueer, androgynous, you know, gender identity and expression, particularly resonates with me in a way that, that fills me with joy and makes me smile. There's a form of Shiva that's half male, half female. Oh my god, how can you not love a god like that? So Shiva inspires me and resonates with me for all of those reasons. I'm getting emotional. Um, <clears throat> so that's what Shiva means to me. So why did I retire Shiva from my altar? That's the question I'm actually asking myself now that I'm actually talking about it. Why? Why would I do that? I mean, admittedly I've been influenced by the whole cultural appropriation thing. Um, I did decide, I mean, recently I've decided to examine paganism probably because I also have very strong pagan leanings towards the Greek and Egyptian gods and the, and the, the Celtic horned god Senunos. Um, because of these pagan leanings I'm also interested in paganism and what I've learned about how pagans are so accepting towards LGBT things for example and the whole, the whole way they deal with relationships and hand fasting it seems very positive to me. Um, it filled me with enormous respect for, for the movement. Um, well, it's a bunch of movements really. Same could be said for Hinduism but anyway I'll come to that in a minute. Um, <laughs> but I've been reading about and learning about paganism because in one, at various points in my life I've been pagan anyway on and off so it's always been there but I've always been treading my own path and totally ignoring all the uh, communities <laughs> of paganism but I've decided to read up on it and, and learn about it um, but anyway um, one thing I read in a book was this pagan notion of blessedness and so I've done a lot of soul searching and thinking about how I feel about this versus Eastern religions like Buddhism and Hinduism and how they view things. Let me explain a little bit. <laughs> Many religions have this notion that there's something wrong that needs fixing. Obviously we know this from Christianity and its whole original sin idea, but it's also there in Buddhism and Hinduism, you know, that um, selfish desire or whatever, uh, negative bad karma or whatever, um, the, the round of rebirth, the samsara, being reborn and stuff and all the karmic effects and everything that up from that and it's, all the, it's a, an aim of both Buddhism and Hinduism to reach a state of spiritual enlightenment where one can let go of these well in the case of Buddhism anyway <laughs> let go of these attachments and, and selfish desires and so you can achieve the state of Nirvana but there's a similar idea in Hinduism with regards to gaining release from rebirth in moksha Moksha, I think, literally means release. Um, so there's still this idea that there's something broken that needs fixing. Pagans don't believe in this, they believe in blessedness. Um, that basically life is blessed, basically life is good. Um, 
Now obviously there are bad things in the world and people do bad things as well. Um, there are mistakes we make, there are ignorant ideas we have, but life's about experiencing isn't it? It's about learning. You learn from your mistakes, you learn your way out of ignorance, but life's about experience and there are bad things but there are good things as well. And I did a bit of soul searching about this and I realised I basically agree with the pagan notion of blessedness. I think release from rebirth is no better or worse than rebirth because life contains good and bad. Um, and we're all here to experience and to learn. I think if you get to a point where you can ascend to a state of oneness with everything, great, but I think in the end you might want to also come back and experience some more. <laughs> That's the thing, you see. I don't see one as better than the other. I mean, maybe in Buddhism and Hinduism there's also this idea that one is not really ultimately better than the other. <laughs> but I suppose maybe as we learn and experience, we grow and we reach that state of where we've joined with the all. Uh, maybe then, as I said, there's a returning to, to be reborn again anyway. But I don't know. <laughs> um, certainly, I mean, I'm not sure I even agree, I even believe in any life after death anyway. But uh, for sake of argument, I'm talking about these issues that way. I, I've done a lot of soul searching and figured that the pagan notion of blessedness is what I agree with more than ideas of, of, of moksha or whatever. And so this was one of the reasons why I thought well I can't really have a Hindu god on my altar if I'm not really Hindu and I don't really subscribe to that so it would be disrespectful so it would be a much more respectful thing to retire Shiva from my altar because I'm pagan really. And uh, that ties into this cultural appropriation idea as well. I'm taking Shiva out of Hinduism and applying it to my own eclectic paganism. Isn't that disrespectful? Um, Shiva, you can't take Shiva out of Hinduism. You can't reject Hinduism but accept Shiva. Or can you? I don't know. Is it disrespectful or isn't it? Because all those things I said that resonate with me, that Shiva means for me, they still do mean for me. And I still want a god that can represent that cyclical nature, that allness <laughs> that she, only Shiva seems to re represent for me. So it's a shame. Um, so those are the conflicted ideas I've got about this. I mean, the thing about being eclectic, Hindus are eclectic. This is the thing I was saying, paganism is not one movement, it's many movements. The same is true of Hinduism really. It's a modern Western idea that we lump it all together and call it Hinduism. Real, in reality, Hinduism consists of many different type, types of, of faith within the broad umbrella of Hinduism. What they share in common is that they are Indian religion that's not some other religion like Buddhism or whatever. Um, you know, the whole Vedic thing with the, the Upanishads, with the, 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 the Brahman that's in all things. Um, this kind of spiritual essence that's in all things thing. That's one aspect of Advaita Vedanta, I believe it's called, uh, aspect of Hinduism, is one aspect of it. But then there's very... Then you've got the very folk religion level of it as well. Um, and you've got certain aspects of, of Hinduism where they basically devote themselves fully to one um, deity, you know. So like the Krishna devotees, like there are Shiva devotees, where Shiva is the one god, you know. Um, all the other gods are really Shiva, Shiva is the one, you know. Like there, there are so many different forms of Hinduism. It's not really one big religion, it's, it's many related religions almost. Um, and Hindus are eclectic. I've seen, I've been to India, I've seen Hindus with Jesus on their altar. They're not Christian but they have Jesus on their altar. They've taken Jesus out of the Christian theology and put it into their own cultural appropriation, yeah? <laughs> why, why is that any different to an eclectic pagan taking Shiva as part of their eclectic paganism, even though they're not Hindu? So, this is the bit where I say, I want to know what Hindus think about this. Shiva represents the divine for me in such a powerful way, such an inspiring way that resonates with me so deeply that I want to worship Shiva. Is it disrespectful of me to take Shiva and put it on my altar, even though I am pagan and not Hindu?
I really, I'm not interested in social justice warriors telling me I'm culturally appropriating. I'm not, I mean, I'd love to hear the comments of anyone that wants to comment, sure. Uh, I always welcome debate, but what I most want to hear from are what Hindus think of this. <laughs> of my love of Shiva, of the fact that I'm an eclectic pagan, not a Hindu, and should or shouldn't I have Shiva on my altar? I really want to know. Thanks for watching.